From the Encyclopedia of Life, this is One Species at a Time. I'm Ari Daniel Shapiro. There are countless animals that have a kind of power over humans that lure us in. They compel us to write mythologies. They make us gaze through a pair of binoculars. Usually the animals are big, charismatic things, like tigers or pandas. But charisma can come in much smaller sizes, too, and trigger just as powerful an attraction. A few months ago, it's this appeal of the small that turned people out in droves. They're amazing. Let it there settle. You now you can see those red underwings. Wow. Oh, wow. That's like awesome. We're in Frostwoods Park, a patch of green in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and our first of three stops. It's nighttime, about 9 p.m., and these couple dozen kids, parents, and neighbors are on the lookout for moths. There's something kind of magical about being out at night with all kinds of biodiversity, everything from the size of a pinhead up to a moth as big as your hand. David Moskowitz is the co-founder of something called National Moth Week. In late July, for an entire week, over 300 moth-inspired events were hosted in every state in the U.S., except North Dakota. North Dakota, where are you? And in numerous places around the world, Costa Rica, Gambia, Bulgaria, even the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. There's always something to find. It's it's like a treasure hunt. The other co-founder, Liddy Haramati, says National Moth Week's intended, in part, to cast aside the view that moths are just a swarm of ugly, winged pests. Some of them are as beautiful as butterflies, or I think even more beautiful than butterflies. Such as the Io moth, or Automeris Io, Haramati's favorite, a bright yellow one with two big black eye spots on its wings. She says that looking for moths can be really rewarding. For one thing, in the U.S., moths outnumber butterflies by about 15 species to one. Not to mention that finding moths at night is pretty easy. All you have to do is turn on a light at night, and they'll come to you. You don't have to go look for them. Two and a quarter miles above sea level, perched atop the continental divide of Cottonwood Pass in central Colorado, our second stop, a generator roars to life, powering a bright light. It's nighttime, and the faces of a dozen people light up in its soft blue glow. Most of them are lepidopterists, who study moths and butterflies by profession. Someone's unrolled a screen in front of the light to catch the moths flapping through the cold mountain air. It's a hepialid, gracilis, for the first time in 30 years. Hold on just a second, it looks like there's something much bigger on the other side. Oh yeah, here we go. I think it's a laziestra. It's still kicking a little bit. Jean-Francois Landry, who drove here from Quebec, James Adams, who flew in from Georgia, and the rest of the group are collecting these high-elevation moths. In terms of unknown diversity, new species, this is kind of the frontier. By far, the youngest person up here is Megan McCarty. She's 16, from Indiana, and is an avid lepidopterist in the making. Oh, this is just a killing jar. I basically put moths in here, and I have poison in here, and then I'll put them in my collection. Her dad, David McCarty, has tagged along, too. I'm a supporter of moth love. I like to see the action, but uh, it's just something that Megan does, and so I drive her out. I like birds. Our last stop is in the middle of the island of Oahu in Hawaii, up past a series of pineapple plantations on a lush path in the Eva Forest Reserve. It's usually closed to the public, and that's because this trail runs along a knife-edge ridge with a sheer drop on either side. But Cynthia King, the entomologist from Hawaii's Division of Forestry and Wildlife, is keeping careful watch over the 17 people who've assembled in the fading daylight. Everybody else have their stuff? Water bottle, flashlight, rain jacket, awesome. A strong gust of wind sweeps across the ridge. Wind's not good for spotting moths. It doesn't allow them to settle on the lit up sheet. But it turns out it was ancient winds that blew most of Hawaii's moth species, 850 and counting, from the mainland out to its islands. That's why the moths in Hawaii tend to be smaller than the ones you'd find in North and South America. Little moths can travel much farther on the wind. Finally, the breeze settles down, and a single moth emerges out of the darkness, a tiny mottled flutter. Kapua Cavello, who's out here with her two kids, gently lowers the moth into a baggie. Hey, there's a moth over here. You guys want to check it out? Cynthia King comes over to investigate. This is a little sphinx moth. Or Hylas Wilsoni Perkinsey. The group spots another several moths, but before long, it's time to pack it in. They head back, walking carefully along the ridgeline, 
and they talk softly about searching for such small treasures beneath the night sky. Their headlamps twinkle along the path like a constellation of slow-moving stars. Special thanks to Rose Eveleth, Erica Kramer, and Nikki Motson for collecting the audio for this story and for taking some great photos, which you can see by visiting eol.org. Our series, One Species at a Time, is produced by Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. I'm Ari Daniel Shapiro.